talk, I speak about uh, in the talk, I speak about my first reading of the trilogy uh, and of the talk being a kind of counter reading. That first reading was, as Lisa mentioned, published in New Political Science in 2019 as Images of International Politics in Chinese Science Fiction. Uh, when I talk about the three body problem, I mean the first book of Liu Cixin's trilogy, which also includes book two, The Dark Forest and book three, Death's End. When I want to refer to the trilogy as a whole, I'll call it either three body which is its popular literary name, or simply the trilogy. Finally, the title of today's talk is Reading Three Body as Utopian International Thought, meaning I intend to take the trilogy as a whole, and so inevitably there are some spoilers for non-book readers. Also, this talk is kind of the basis of a forthcoming book chapter that I've got in a collaborative volume that's coming up from the University, of, uh, University Press of Florida called The Three Body Problem and International Relations, so keep a lookout for that. Okay, so on to the talk proper, reading three body as utopian international thought. Liu Cixin's trilogy can be profitably interpreted from the standpoint of international relations theory, in particular, the offensive realism that is prominent in contemporary IR. Such indeed was my initial impulse upon being introduced to the work. In the present talk, I'd like to supplement and in some degree challenge that original interpretation with a counter reading one motivated by the humanistic focus of science fiction studies, which is after all the academic discipline directed towards the interpretation of science fiction texts. This implies a reorientation rather than an abandonment of the task of, re of relating the viewer's work to strategic international affairs. Science fiction studies has a distinctive approach to the past, present and future international, one which questions the degree to which contemporary IR contains much strategic thought at all. The present talk thus seeks to move away from the power and security dominance of IR realism and toward the values and agency focus of science fiction studies' fundamental concern with utopian thought. The goal is not to replace my first reading with this second, but instead to suggest the multivalence of texts and their susceptibility to equally useful interpretations organized by radically different frames. After briefly recapping my original reading of the text, I engage the concepts of science fiction studies and particularly its approach to utopian thought as organizing ideas for a counter reading. I then identify both the explicit and the implicit utopian thought in Lewis trilogy before considering how this new interpretation of the text might be put in dialogue with contemporary IR concerns. It is perhaps worth briefly summarizing my initial reading of Three Body as a text running parallel with neorealist international thought. That was my, my original idea. The central conceit of this reading was that Liu's text is intelligible through the lenses of Kenneth N. Waltz's images of international politics as developed in Man, the State and War. An image for Waltz is a structure of interpretation that bounds and makes legible a realm of social activity, such as international conflict. Waltz developed three images, human nature, domestic politics, and the international system as lenses to isolate and perceive the dynamics of international interactions. In Man, the State and War, Waltz reached the conclusion that the international system was the foremost driver of conflict dynamics, a conclusion he refined and emphasized in his theory of international politics. In this initial reading, I argued that each image was useful in interpreting the trilogy. The first image, human nature, helped make IR sense of the first book, The Three Body Problem. Ye and Jay's despairing conclusions about good and evil, the negative view of humanity held, held by the Earth Trisolorus organization, and the Trisolorans all too human exhibition of colonialist tendencies were all central to events and all interpretable through Waltz's first image. The second image on domestic political institutions and ideologies was perhaps the least fr fruitful of the three as an interpretive structure, I argued. Nonetheless, significant plot developments hinged on the communist nature of 1960s China and the essentially fascistic nature of the Trisoloran government. Most compelling in interpreting the text was Waltz's third image on the international system. The trilogy's second novel, The Dark Forest, is bookended by an exercise in deductive theorizing about the dynamics of competitive social systems. The conclusions, 
that there are a vast number of civilizations in the universe, but only so much space, that each civilization has survival as its primary goal, and the conflict is therefore perpetual and individually rational, rather precisely mirror the axioms of neorealism. Further plot details introduce concepts analogous to game theory and deterrence that are cognizable as part of a broader neorealist research program in international relations, a research program that focuses upon the fixedness of principles of strategic interaction across time and space. I noted in this original reading that Liu seemed to be up to something very different in the final pages of the trilogy's conclusion, Death's End. He raised the possibility of universe shaping agency, the historicization of the apparently immutable and the potential for radical changes to the rules of the conflict game. At the last, this cast a different light over the literary terrain Liu had trodden. I take this as the jumping off point for the present talk for this present calendar reading. I want to say a little bit now about the academic field of science fiction studies. The academic field of science fiction studies focuses upon the fictional presentation of worlds different from, yet systematically related to our own. These imagined societies have been reordered by some social, biological, or technological intervention, which leads human or human-like collectivities to operate on principles that are decisively better, utopic, or worse, dystopic, than our present reality. Science fiction studies historicizes the present by showing it to be the preamble to a future transform, and in so doing destabilizes the dominant ideology of the author or reader's empirical environment. In this way, science fiction is viewed by scholars as an inherently critical genre directed toward normative questions of agency, justice, and emancipation. At the heart of the matter, is the conceptual work done by the scholar of comparative literature, Darko Suvin. Uh, sorry, excuse me. At the heart of the matter is the conceptual work done by the scholar of comparative literature, Darko Suvin, who might be said to be as central to science fiction studies, as subject of both fealty and detraction, as Kenneth Waltz has been to contemporary international relations theory. In his path-breaking work, Metamorphoses of Science Fiction, Suvin sought to isolate generic features of a corpus of literary SF works that might render them amenable to deep critical analysis. He thus identified science fiction as a literature of, quote, cognitive estrangement. Estrangement is the effect produced by the presentation of a situation and our society that is meaningfully different from what the reader might regard as their empirical environment. Estrangement was produced by what Suvin termed the fictional works novum, an intervention of technology, for example, time travel, or outside force, for example, aliens, that lies outside of actual experience and is central to the plot of the fictional work. Cognition is the effect by which the altered reality is tethered to the reader's world through the consistent operation of principles of natural science or recognizable social and individual dynamics. These two, cognition and estrangement, work in a push-pull dialectic each necessary to the work of science fiction. Other genres have cognition, for example, literary realism, or estrangement, for example, fantasy, but science fiction is the genre where both cognition and estrangement are necessary. Crucially, Darko Suvin insisted that the literature of cognitive estrangement had uses beyond idle escapism. The destabilization of the reader's empirical reality meant that science fiction could be a uniquely powerful literature of change. The focus of science fiction was only superficially the novum, the aliens or the new technology. More important was the effect this novum had upon human societies and how they wrestled with its implications. The message of the genre to its readers was that the world was not settled. What was taken as natural today would not inevitably be so tomorrow. And the possibilities for change, especially change driven by engaged human agents, were significant. Do not believe, science fiction says to its readers, the ideologies of literary fiction immersed in internal psychodrama amidst an immutable environment, nor of fantasy concerned with the supernatural that lay beyond the ken of the ordinary person. Seize instead the chance for change wrought by your own hands. 
at the center of science fiction studies and of the new reading of three bodies that I propose in this talk is the concept of utopia. Utopia was once a vital, but is now largely abandoned part of IR, but it remains a, a or perhaps the vital concept in the study of science fiction. Indeed, there is a widespread suggestion that the contemporary utopia is found largely or even exclusively within the science fiction genre, and that science fiction is the only generic tradition in which utopian thought remains vibrant. The utopia is the social dream by which groups of people imagine radically different ways of arranging their lives. These ways may be significantly better or significantly worse than present arrangements, but the crucial point is that different arrangements are achievable through human action. It is worth noting that the oppositional continuum in utopian thought is not between better utopia and worse dystopia. It is rather between the allowance for an imagination of change, which is called utopia, and the disavowal and censorship of such change-oriented thought, which is called anti-utopia. The target of a dystopia in science fiction studies is not, as it is in contemporary international relations theory, the utopian fantasies of insufficiently hard-headed strategies. Instead, the message of a dystopia is that agency matters, and engagement, including mass engagement, is imperative to avoid the terrible destination for which the current course is set. From a science fiction studies perspective, societal affairs, including international security affairs, need not and should not be left to experts preaching, quote, hard truths and, quote, difficult but necessary choices, as it is this rigid status quo thinking and not the attempt to make a better world that produces real dystopias. Within international relations, the term utopia was rendered pejorative by the skillful polemicist E.H. Carr, who associated the term with failed attempts to move beyond statist power politics in the early 20th century. This rhetorical exercise, begun by Carr and continued by the prominent theorist Hans Morgenthau, successfully associated notions, uh, successfully associated notions of values-based international politics with disastrous outcomes, while associating power-oriented strategies resting on supposedly immutable facts of human nature and international imperatives with a scientific, rational, an expert-led approach to international decision-making. The apogee of this thought came in the work of the aforementioned Kenneth N. Waltz, who laundered the unsavory implications of realism, that human nature was irredeemably egoistic and mostly brutal, by recasting the whole affair as driven by impersonal and unchangeable principles of strategic interaction. Functionally equivalent units, Waltz's term for human social structures such as the nation state, were said to be pushed and pulled by unseen yet immensely powerful international systems towards actions that were beyond morality and therefore beyond reproach, being the only possible responses to circumstances as they were and would always be. The popularity of this theorizing placed a particular conception of security seeking behavior at the center of international politics and reified this behavior as the only reasonable course of action for states and statespersons. The circumstances which promoted these actions were cast as timeless truths revealed by hard-headed thought and hard-won experience. The basis for the remainder of this talk is now set. I'm seeking to contrast my initial reading of Three Body based on Waltzian neorealism with a new reading based on the concept of the utopian hermeneutic. That, by hermeneutic, I mean that way of thinking and reading that looks for the destabilization and denaturalization of the status quo and searches the, the horizon for possibilities of a better tomorrow. I aim to use three bodies imagination of the future as a means to destabilize our concept of the present and open up possibilities for a better world, specifically a better conception of international relations. Opening up possibilities is a crucial pre-political act that provides intellectual and motivational resources for change that is to say, this counter-reading is intended as more than just an intellectual exercise in literary studies and international thought. Okay, so moving to uh, reading Three Body as Utopia. The thrust of this reading is that Three Body masquerades, and it is only a masquerade, as an anti-utopian text. Its seeming adherence to power politics rationalism is, in this view, a distraction from the work's push towards a radical reimagination of the principles of international 
or universal society. Eustachian's smokescreen serves two functions. First, it is a means of disarming readers who would be unwilling or unable to accept utopianism presented without the soothing and familiar guise, familiar disguise of cynical egoism. Second, it is a long game, game setter for the culmination of the trilogy where cynicism is decisively and finally rejected. The most explicit utopian features of the text come in at the final book, Death's End, with the revelation of the agentic origins and mutable nature of the strategic setting that had served as a seemingly unchangeable backdrop for the earlier novels, The Three-Body Problem and The Dark Forest. At the core of my first reading of Lewis' text, as homologous to neorealist IR theory, was the presentation of survival-seeking aggressive behavior as a rational response to the circumstances in which actors find themselves. Agency here is circumscribed. Actors may choose to act counter to situational incentives, but they're foolish to do so and will be punished by the differential success of those that follow the imperatives of the environment. Liu extends these dynamics beyond the international state system. They drive the dyadic encounter between Earth and Trisolaris, are expanded into a general strategic account of the dark forest nature of the universe, and are replicated in the dark battles over resources, which take place between human warships in deep space. Those who act contrary to this logic are, for much of the trilogy, punished and scorned. Chung Shin, the central figure of Death's End, is the prime example. Taking over as sword holder, the human element in Earth's deterrent system, from the, from the strategic savant Liu Ji, she is instantly appraised by the Trisolorans as being unwilling to carry out the logic of mutually assured destruction. The Trisolorans attack and destroy humanity's deterrent capability. Later, she is offered the chance to develop light speed capable ships that might allow some portion of humanity to escape annihilation, but at the cost of an armed conflict that would kill many thousands. Again, she declines to take what is presented as the hard but necessary decision, what we might read as the neo-realist decision. Yet the narrative turns as Death's End progresses and more becomes known as the historical rather than natural production of the strategic setting. Fundamental features of the universe, its three-dimensional nature, the speed at which light travels, are revealed as the collateral damage of long-run galactic wars, invisible to Earth and Trisolaris, who are mere bit part players. Dark forest strikes, which are planetary annihilation attacks launched by advanced civilizations upon detecting others, are, quote, nothing more than snipers shooting at the careless, messengers, messmen, etc. In the grand scheme of battle, they are nothing. The Earth Trisolaris conflict, which occupies the great bulk of the trilogy, is eventually recast as, quote, just a detail of the cosmos. Weapons of war, we are told in the trilogy's final act, have collapsed the universe from its 10-dimensional origins into its current three-dimensional state. Further, such strikes will reduce three dimensions into two. The speed of light as we know it is radically diminished from its original near-infinite value. The universe's velocity is a victim of pollution and the destructive force of the technologies of other civilizations. The strategic setting then is created by agents and is a product of history rather than being natural, inevitable, and immutable. This reading replaces Lewis' text into the critical utopian rather than the rational positivist tradition. His story is one of uncovering the true nature of things, of troubling the argument that the status quo is somehow inevitable, and of reclaiming a space for transformative agentic action. Indeed, not only is the security environment in the trilogy revealed to be historically rather than naturally produced, it's also unstable and unsustainable. The creeping collapse into two dimensions and the continued diminishment of the street speed of light are the fruits of ongoing conflict, the results of galactic weapons of mass destruction. The status quo cannot indefinitely hold, and so cynical security-seeking behavior is not the cost of stability, as in neorealist thought, but is itself a radically destabilizing force. Chung Xin and Guan Yifan, amongst the last humans billions of years into the future, learn that the universe is dying, 
from this collateral damage caused by incessant war. Stability is shown to be both illusory and immiserating, as countless civilizations are annihilated, while others cower in fear and debase themselves in order to survive. These final humans are offered one last egoistic bargain. They find themselves secreted in a pocket universe of one square kilometer, where they can live an idyllic life separate from the turmoil of the macro universe. Yet it becomes apparent that a critical point has been reached. The universe needs to be reset to its identic 10 dimensional state, yet has lost so much mass to countless fugitive pocket universes like theirs, that it is in danger of collapsing, not in a new cleansing big bang, but instead drifting apart forever, a void of dark and nothingness. To achieve the critical mass for a big bang reset, sufficient numbers of pocket universes must return to the central universe. The choice of any one pocket universe is irrelevant to the ultimate outcome, and the pocket universes have no means of communicating with each other to coordinate their actions. So the choice facing Chung Shin and Guang Mi Fan is of altruism or egoism, to blindly trust that enough others will choose to return with them to the macro universe or to live out their lives in the comfort and safety of their private haven. They choose to return, a decisive moment of social dreaming and positive action. Crucially, it is Chung Shun, whose utopianism has been treated thus far as disastrous, who makes the decision to think outside of the seemingly constraining logic of the system. She is no superhero. This is a story of values rather than extraordinary individuals. Guan Fan recasts Chung Shin's previous failures to not enforce deterrence and to not allow light speed escape ships to be built. She was chosen, he says, by humanity to be in a position to make those decisions. And she was chosen because her values and not those of the dark forest were those that humanity wanted to express. Quote, I want to tell all those who believe in God that I am not the chosen one, she says. I also want to tell all the atheists that I'm not a history maker. I am but an ordinary person. Unfortunately, I've not been able to walk the ordinary person's path. My path is, in reality, the journey of a civilization. The above described denouement demands a rereading of the body and not just the conclusion of Liu's trilogy in a search for the prefigurings of utopian thought scattered throughout. In my initial reading, I've thought of the treaty's late revelations at uh, the trilogy's late revelations as a plot twist a departure from the rest of the books that stood apart from their logic. And this is the wider critical view. Indeed, the ending is rarely discussed at all. As Ji Yang Fan wrote in The New Yorker, quote, at every turn, the characters are forced to make brutal calculations in which moral absolutism is pitted against the greater good. In their pursuit of survival, men and women employ Machiavellian game theory and adopt oblique consequentialism. Uh, pardon me, um, oblique consequentialism. In Liu's fictional universe, idealism is fatal and kindness is an exorbitant luxury. Gaffrick and Payton concur that the Quillid trilogy is, quote, radically pessimistic, while Chung Chung Jiang reads, quote, social Darwinistic, misogynistic, and totalitarian tendencies out of the text. The problem, she writes, lies in the totalizing, reductive, and potentially dangerous dualism of humanity, morality, and democracy and destruction versus animality, reason, autocracy, and survival on which the plot and character development rest. The world of the three body problem is one of a permanent state of exception, suffocated by moral dilemmas and devoid of politics, insofar as politics is about possibilities for action and the plurality of social relations, end quote. This certainly accords with the neo-realist image of three body, which is my original reading. Neorealism being essentially a parable about the necessity of cold rationalism in a harshly Darwinistic environment. Chung Chung Chang is also undoubtedly correct that the text indulges in reductive and negative gen gender stereotypes on several occasions. But a counter reading based on a utopian hermeneutic uncovers prefigurations of progressive thought throughout the trilogy. In this reading, the final movement is not so much a left field plot twist as it is the reaping of carefully sown seeds of hope. 
As a first matter, we might consider the time scale on which the trilogy operates. Much of the text deals with the roughly 700 years from the 1960s until the 2680s. And during this period, the story is indeed one of tragedy, brutality, recurring cycles of societal rebirth, inevitably followed by destruction, and the ever-present logic of egoistic rationalism amidst a competitive survival environment. Read through utopian eyes, this is the bit before the switch. 700 years seems at first to be long enough for the discovery of fundamental laws of history and behavior. That similar, cynical, bad kinds of things happen over long periods in what appear to be different contexts seems intended at first to be read as confirmation of the immutably brutal philosophy of Liu's text. Yet this time scale, 700 years, is eventually revealed to be minuscule, and these contexts far from representative of the true scope of possibilities contained within the trilogy. Death's End, the final book, radically expands the scope of the story, beginning with a brief episode in the 15th century to 17 billion years in the future. Dark Forest theory, which seems at first to support the trans-historical scope of neorealist thought, is later dismissed as, quote, just a detail of the cosmos. What neorealists call the functional equivalent of units, the singular goal of survival seeking necessitated by the security environment, is revealed to be only a partial account of possible kinds of actors and behaviors. This is a quote from, uh, from the final book, from Death's End. The universe contains multitudes. You can find any kind of people and world. There are idealists, pacifists, philanthropists, and even civilizations dedicated only to art and beauty. It's true that the next line is, quote, they're not mainstream, they cannot change the direction of the universe, but the text shortly reveals the possibility that they can. It is this possibility upon which Chung Shin and Guan Fan base their decision to trust that the universe can be reset by collective action to its Edenic state. And what of the text's position on human nature? The realist tradition rests on a view of human nature as self-interested, brutal, and unchangeable. The utopian tradition, by contrast, views human nature, or perhaps more accurately, the mores and values of individual and societal life, as agentic, self-reflexive, and therefore containing the potential for radical transformation in the direction of universal dignity. In my first reading, I made much of Ye Wen Jie's meditation early in the three-body problem about humanity and evil. And this is a quote from, from that book. Is it possible that the relationship between humanity and evil is similar to the relationship between the ocean and an iceberg floating on its surface? Both the ocean and the iceberg are made of the same material. That the iceberg seems separate is only because it's in a different form. In reality, it is but a part of the vast ocean. It was impossible to expect a moral awakening from humankind itself, just like it was impossible to expect humans to lift off the earth by pulling up their own hair. To achieve moral awakening required a force outside the human race. This thought determined the entire direction of Ye's life, end quote. Similarly, the character Mike Evans finds humanity a sickeningly narcissistic species, guilty of multiple genocides against other species on Earth. Another character, a literature professor, pronounces the human race, quote, hideous. I've spent the first half of my life unveiling this ugliness with the scalpel of literature, but now even I'm sick of the work of dissection, end quote. However, most of this pessimistic discourse on human nature is confined to the first book, set in the near past and the near future. It is, of course, the point of the second book, The Dark Forest, to recast the first book's focus on evil, a matter of human nature, into a focus on tragedy, a matter of circumstance. Notably, it is Ye Wan Jie herself who leads Liu Ji to an understanding of cosmic sociology, the text analog to neorealism, which stresses the strategic environment as the motivating factor producing tragic behavior. The view of evil human nature as a driving force behind events does not survive even her lifetime. The literature professor is never heard of again, and Mike Evans suffers a spectacular death. Neither are long-run shapers of events. Ye's daughter, Yang Dong, has access to her mother's life and works through a trove of discovered documents. 
Yang takes the same raw materials as her mother, her experience of humanity, and a rare knowledge of the proliferation of other life throughout the universe, and reaches radical and critical conclusions. Quote, how much has the universe been changed by life? She asks. Is nature really natural? Her view is not of human nature as immutable and evil. She comes instead to think of all life as agentic in shaping its circumstances on even the most macro of scales. It is though Chung Shin, the protagonist of Death's End, who offers the most significant counterpoint to the pessimism of the early parts of the trilogy. She is at times portrayed as weak, big hearted and soft headed and embodying quote, feminine qualities of love and compassion that are easily taking advantage of in the public sphere. Yet not only are these same qualities crucial to the hopeful ending of the trilogy, the decision to return to the macro universe to trigger its restart, but these qualities are explained in the text as neither individual nor gendered defects, but rather the central wishes of society at large, a society that has evolved even during, a even during a relatively short span of time and under the threat of annihilation into a more compassionate and empathetic collective. Cheng Xin was elevated to positions of authority because her values resonate with the hopes, dreams, and expressed preferences of humanity writ large. Cheng Xin is therefore not an idealist outlier, but a true representative of human nature. The final confrontation between the utopian progressivism of Cheng Xin and the cynicism of realist thought comes in a face-off with Thomas Wade, a rival for the sword, sword holder position. Wade says, if we lose our human nature, we lose much. If we lose our bestial nature, we lose everything. Cheng Xin disagrees, and she says, I choose human nature. Xin here is neither naive nor weak. She is making a conscious choice of values over cynicism. And crucially, the society which elevates her to a position of strategic responsibility is making the same choice and with full cognizance of its possible costs. As Guan Fan tells her, Human quote, humanity chose you, which meant they chose to treat life and everything else with love, even if they had to pay a great price. You fulfilled the wish of the world, carried out their values, and executed their choice, end quote. Thus, Ye Wen Jie's quote in the first pages of the three-body problem, often taken as the text's manifesto on human nature, is decisively repudiated in the final pages of Death Sand. Life, at least human life, is neither passive nor bestial, but instead agentic and reflexive. Values here emerge as central to the direction of history, and their evolution in a radically positive, indeed utopian direction, is presented as the collective achievement of humanity. A final utopian prefiguration in the text contains the status of scientific truth claims. Three body is often lauded as hard science fiction, with a particular fel felicity with and fidelity to the concept of contemporary physics. Further, the deductive realize, re excuse me, further, the deductive reasoning employed by Liu Ji in elaborated cosmic sociology mirrors that employed by Kenneth Waltz in explicating neorealism. Thus, the analogy between cosmic sociology and neorealism lies not only in their conclusions, but in their method both seek the prestige of a hard science theorizing. This deductive theorizing and inductive testing model, often called positivist in contemporary social science, has been central to the dominance of neorealist thought in international relations. Great efforts have been made to brand these theories as objective and rigorous, endorsed and refined by disinterested scientists motivated purely by a search for truth. Yet these claims are controversial amongst the critical IR community, a community that includes those few in the discipline who remain interested in utopian modes of thought. For these critics, social theories that try to run parallel with natural science are committing a category mistake, as humans are reflexive agents rather than passive and inert matter. And researchers, however much they might try, cannot divorce themselves from the ideological and value commitments that underpin all human activity including the search for truth. Neorealism, to its critics, is merely a particular approach to the world suffused with unstated yet powerful value claims. 
Neorealism's supposed body of empirical support is produced by methods that are, al that are aligned with the premises of the theory itself. It is unsurprising that a theory which stresses hard truths should insist that the first hard truth is that the theory itself is correct. Reread through Utopian Eyes, the opening novel, The Three Body Problem, is pregnant with doubts about, absolute truth, about absolutist truth claims reached through a supposedly universal scientific method. The novel opens during the uh, Cultural Revolution, a time when the scientific enterprise was suffused with ideological peril. Consider this, this exchange presented between Yang and his daughter. But her father said, theory is the foundation of application. Isn't discovering fundamental laws the biggest contribution to our time? Yang hesitated and finally revealed his real concern. It's easy to make ideological mistakes in theory. At this early point in the text, this exchange seems to be classic anti-utopian rhetoric. Chinese communism as a totalitarian attempt uh, to impose an impossible utopia impro imp improperly mixes politics with the search for truth and derails the ladder. However, the text immediately reveals another queasy uncertainty about scientific truth claims, the Sophon interference with human scientific experimentation, which renders the scientific method itself wholly unreliable. The text then offers yet a third view of scientific inquiry as potentially unreliable, a matter not of method, but of faith. Quote, to accomplish something in theoretical physics requires one to have almost religious faith. It's easy to be led into the abyss, end quote. Liu Sishin is the sowing seeds that he will eventually harvest on the unreliability of value-free, view-from-nowhere hard science, at least as applied to social affairs. His text offers multiple critiques of this view, while at the same time seeming to advance a very specific set of social conclusions that rest on it, the axioms of cosmic sociology. It should come as no surprise then that cosmic sociology, the text's homologue to neorealism, is eventually revealed to be based on contingent and historical factors rather than timeless truths. Cosmic sociology offers no greater insight into the fundamental truths of the universe than does theoretical physics under the influence of ideological pressures and the Sophon law. Instead, the final resolution of the text is driven by utopian dreaming, what one might regard as an act of faith, but faith not in some mystic higher or alien power, but instead in the inherent goodness of reflective agents. And so I want to end with just a, a few comments on what we might gain from rereading Free Body via utopianism. Rereading Free Body via utopianism offers insights to contemporary international relations. But they operate more in the register of opening up long run law, excuse me. They operate more in the register of opening up long run political possibilities than in uncovering here and now conflict stratagems. That is to say, the riches uncovered by this reading are of a very different type than those produced by a neorealist reading. There is nothing wrong with this, of course. Texts are polyvalent and so can support multiple readings and be put to multiple uses. The major opportunity uncovered by the current reading is to think about the IR popular culture interface as directed toward facilitating transformation rather than accounting for stability and the status quo. Much work in international relations engages popular culture texts as social sites that serve to normalize and perpetuate understandings of states and state action so as to make their behaviors possible and legible. Thus, popular culture texts are regarded as meaning-making enterprises encoded with narratives of self-identity, representations of the other, and a set of value judgments on which actions are normative and which are beyond the pale. They help to understand how states and their societies make sense of themselves and others, and how they produce menus and repertoires of action and response. Reading Three Body as a work of neorealist thought, as I at first did, fits this conception of popular culture studies. The text in this interpretation acts to legitimize state-based power politics, as well as a deductive empirical model of scientific inquiry. This lets a researcher think about the coming into being and recirculation of the contemporary order, but doesn't readily facilitate visions of a possible future organized along fundamentally different value propositions. This latter goal, of course, 
has been the task of the present reading based around utopia. Three Body does not, of course, offer a blueprint of the utopia. The utopia described in Three Body, a 10 dimensional universe with an infinite speed of light is not realized in the text, we don't think and is offered up as only a hypothetical possibility within the fictional world. But blueprints are not the currency of contemporary utopia. The utopian impulse is instead concerned with the opening of the collective imagination about how things could be different. The possibility on offer is to think about international relations as an open rather than a closed system of thought, where utopian thought acts to denaturalize status quo thinking, to detect emancipatory openings within it, and to motivate movements towards some sort of better situation. 10 dimensional universes are probably beyond our capacity to theorize in international relations, but there are more reasonable avenues of inquiry that might be opened by a re-engagement with values-led thinking. One is simply to ask different questions, such as Mark Newfield's suggestion, what if international politics is not about power and prosperity, but about inclusion and exclusion? Approaching three body as neorealist thought yielded an array of insights into the recurrent dilemmas of position and power in a competitive social system. Reviewed through a utopian lens, three body throws into question the very premises and possibilities of any social system. Which reading is correct? Both, neither, and many others besides. It is perhaps worth ending by noting that Liu Sushin himself professes to have little idea what his text is really about. Given a test designed for middle school students on the meanings and themes of his trilogy, he didn't answer a single question correctly. I don't begin with some conceit in mind, he said. I'm just trying to tell a good story. Thank you very much.